Um, okay, so yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. I, I believe my task, as it often is, um, is to try and rain on the parade. So this is my <laughs> my best attempt. Now, since um, Sally is here, um, one of the the world experts on gender, and obviously knows much more about gender than I do, you might wonder why I've presumpt presumptuously decided to talk about gender. But unfortunately, that rests on um, Objection rests on the sin of confusing use and mention. My topic, of course, is the word gender, which is completely different. So um, let me start by um, reinventing the wheel and um, rather confusingly not even calling it the wheel. So by, <laughs> conceptual, by conceptual engineering, I mean following Hermann, the process of assessing and improving our representational devices in particular words. And here are three kinds of conceptual or better linguistic engineering. Uh, neologistic conceptual engineering, where you um, coin a new word or phrase or appropriate a word or phrase from ordinary language and give it a new meaning, as it might be. By conceptual engineering, I mean the process of assessing and improving our representational devices. Carnapian conceptual engineering, where you take some ordinary language construction and then for the purposes of this talk or the purposes of this conference or the purposes of this book chapter, um, you stipulate some perhaps more precise or convenient meaning for it related to the meaning in ordinary language. So for example, you might say, okay, by if then in this paper, um, you should understand, uh, or you should interpret if then in this paper as the material conditional. And then there's the kind that I'm interested in, which is Dave's homonymous conceptual re-engineering, um, and what I'm calling ordinary conceptual engineering. And ordinary conceptual engineering, as I understand it, is the following um, task, one, I, one, one sees that a term of ordinary language is somehow defective. It's, to use Sally's terminology, it's not cutting logical space or slicing reality at the right point. And the conceptual engineer, having identified this problem, wants to take the ordinary language term into the workshop, fix up its meaning, and then return it to general circulation. So now, at the end of a piece of successful conceptual engineering, the ordinary language term is being new, used with its spanking new and much better meaning. Okay, so uh, let me just say something about Sally, because she often gets the blame for starting all this. <laughs> so in the, um, in the famous 2000 paper, Gender and, and Race, she's very much a lukewarm ordinary conceptual engineer, a point which is often not uh, emphasized. So she says, I think there are rhetorical advantages to using the terms gender, man, woman, and race for the concepts I've defined. But if someone else is determined to have those terms, I'll use different ones. So that's the first point. She's not really wedded to the term um, woman. And then the second point is that there's nothing, as I recall in that paper, that hints that there's anything defective about our ordinary terms, woman, man, uh, gender, and so forth. Um, OK, so yeah, so I think fundamentally what she wanted to do was just make a, uh, an important uh, distinction. That's different from doing ordinary conceptual engineering, as I understand it. OK, so are, are there any, before I go on to gender, are there any examples of successful conceptual engineering outside philosophy. That is, are there any examples of cases where we somehow realized, oh my god, you know, this word means a certain thing, and that's, uh, that, that, that is not the right distinction to make. We kind of got it wrong when we introduced the word in the first place. It should, should really have meant the other thing. So let's um, try and somehow collectively, implicitly fix things up, and then at the end of the process, Lo and behold, the word has changed meaning. Are there any examples of that? So I think Herman is sympathetic with the idea 
in the book that there are some examples. So here are some candidates that he gives marriage, rape, person, and salad. Let me just say something about marriage, which is a sort of perennial example. So here the idea is, oh my god, we just we realize that um, the word marriage didn't, doesn't apply to Adam and Steve. Whoops, that was an oversight. Um, and then we all, a lot of us, realized that, that was an oversight, and the whole the word changes meaning and expands an extension, so it, it, or intention. So it includes the pair Adam and Steve, whereas it didn't before. Now, I'm very skeptical that this has happened to the word marriage. So uh, let me just give you some reasons why I'm skeptical. So Im imagine, so, suppose the amelioration, the meaning change happened in the tw 20th century. And imagine someone in the 19th century predicting confidently, as she would put it, there will never be same-sex marriage. And I think it's very natural for us to say, you know, just using the word marriage as we ordinarily use it, well, she was wrong. That prediction turned out to be incorrect. And the, this does seem to be diagnostic for a change of meaning, because um, if we have a somewhat artificial example involving the natural numbers, so it's kind of optional whether you include zero in the natural numbers or not. Mathematicians have developed little subscripts to disambiguate. But imagine that. Um, Earlier, um, the expression natural number did not refer to zero, just referred to one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And then uh, later, it gets changed. So now the extension is more inclusive. It, it includes zero, whereas before it didn't. And if we imagine someone saying, some mathematician saying at some pre-amelioration time, zero is not a natural number, and we imagine some other mathematician B at the later time saying A was wrong, well, that seems bad. Right? Uh, A wasn't wrong. Contrast the marriage case. Here's the, um, the definition of the word watch. Oh, sorry, sorry, that's, uh, whoops. Sorry, so that's my slide there. Whoops, okay. Here's, here's the, uh, the definition of the word watch from the first edition of Webster's Dictionary in 1828. Um, clearly, this is not a definition of the word um, watch. I mean, the bit about machinery being moved by a spring. It's just an illustration of the fact that dictionary entries often do double duty as encyclopedia entries, in this case, giving some useful information about how actual watches work. Though a competent user of the word watch in the 19th century might well say, I cannot even imagine what sorts of watches there might be in the future. Perhaps they work by some technology that to us is indistinguishable from magic. So um, when uh, Apple reimagined the watch, uh, they didn't reimagine the word watch. So the word watch, plausibly, as we use it, has the very same meaning as it did back in the, back in the 19th century. It's just that people in the 19th century couldn't imagine what future watches would be like. So perhaps um, so one, one option um, is to say that um, what we did was uh, what we did was reimagine marriage. Here's the definition of marriage in uh, uh, Webster's dictionary: the act of uniting a man and woman for life. Um, perhaps people in the 19th century couldn't have imagined uh, that. There could be um, a marriage between, say, two men. Incidentally, it was just setting aside same-sex marriage and also setting aside the implication that polygam polygamous marriages are not marriages, um, this definition was already known to be extensionally inadequate because in some branches of Islam, there are fixed-term uh, marriages. Anyway, so one option is to say, you know, it's like watch. Just as a Apple reimagined the watch, perhaps we recently reimagined marriage, but we don't even need to say that. Here's um, the, the uh, 
Roman historian Suetonius in the lives of the 12 Caesars talking about the Emperor Nero. Nero castrated the boy Sporus and actually tried to make a woman of him, and he married him with all the usual ceremonies, including a dowry and bridal veil, took him to his house attended by a great throng, and treated him as his wife. Okay, so this is why I think marriage is just not a good example of ordinary conceptual engineering. Are there any clear cases of ordinary conceptual engineering outside philosophy? Um, well, Sally suggested family as an example yesterday, so we could talk about that. But anyway, let me get on to my case study, namely uh, the word gender. So, as Sally says at a couple of points in Resisting Reality, in everyday discourse, the term gender now seems to be equivalent to sex, and yet many feminist theorists still argue that gender is the social category. And then in another place, she says, outside a rather narrow segment of the academic world, the term gender has come to function as the polite way to talk about the sexes. And I just wanted to sort of go over some of the history here because I think it's instructive. So um, here's um, Henry Watson Fowler, the great lexicographer, the author of the idiosyncratic modern English usage, published in 1926, is the entry for gender. It's a grammatical term only. To talk of persons or creatures of the masculine or feminine gender, meaning of the male or female sex, is either a jocularity, permissible or not, according to context, <laughs> or, or a blunder. So Fowler was the sort of the original language maven. Um, so um, Fowler's almost certainly not correct about this. So here's um, George Eliot, Mary Anna Evans, in the mill on the floss, 1860. This is probably not jocular enough uh, by <laughs> Fowler's standards. Public opinion in these cases is always of the feminine gender, not the world, but the world's wife. Though gender has meant sex for centuries, even though it hasn't been used very frequently for sex. Okay, so the, the next um, landmark date is 1955. So this is John Money, um, psychologist and sexologist who established the Gender Identity Clinic at Johns Hopkins in 1965. He was a, a big neologistic conceptual engineer um, and in a paper in 1955, he introduced the term gender role, which he says is used to signify all those things that a person says or does to disclose himself or herself as having the status of boy or man, girl or woman, respectively. It includes, but is not restricted to, sexuality in the sense of eroticism. Okay, so this is an example of... Um, a bad neologism, a neologism that um, doesn't catch on. And over the next maybe 20 years or so, um, it was realized that money's gender role was way too capacious to be theoretically interesting. It lumped together a whole bunch of things that really should be kept separate. And so um, uh, gender role was parceled out into its different components on the right. So one component, awareness of belonging to one sex, I'll get onto this in a bit, was called gender identity. Another bit is sexual orientation, whether you're homosexual or bisexual or heterosexual. Um, another component was sex-typed social roles, like, say, primary caregiver of children being a female-typed social role. Um, those got called uh, gender roles, using money's old terminology. And then the sex-typed attitudes and behavior, or feminine versus masculine attitudes and behavior, and that got called um, gender. I'll come on to that as well. Let's go through these three things in order. Okay, so the next date is 1964, and that's when a psychologist at UCLA 
called Robert Stoller introduced the term gender identity. He introduced it in a paper, and it later figured in a very famous book of his published in 1968 called Sex and Gender. So gender identity, as Stoller defined it, is the sense of knowing to which sex one belongs, that is the awareness I am a male or I am a female. And um, most contemporary definitions in psychology of gender identity basically follow Stoller, sometimes tweaking a little bit. So here, for example, is the American Philosophical Association explanation of that term from American, sorry, did I say philosophical? Sorry, uh, the APA, yeah, right, sorry, the American, thank you, the American Psychological Association. Like, actually, there is like numerous APAs, I think. Um, um, that is from 2009, I think. Gender identity refers to a person's basic sense of being male, female, or of indeterminate sex. So here, um, you can see the phrase sex identity, sorry, the phrase gender identity could very well um, um, have, been, uh, have been sex identity. I mean, the word, there's no need to take the word gender in gender identity to mean anything other than sex, and indeed, at least one person suggested that sex identity would have been a much better term than uh, gender identity. Uh, okay, so what about gender roles? Okay, so um, so gender roles used to be called sex roles uh, back in the 1950s, um, and that was the original, I can't remember when the <coughs> journal Sex Roles started up, but at any rate, at any, any event, it, it started up when um, sex roles were much more popular than gender roles, this is a Google n-gram showing the frequency of the phrase gender roles versus the phrase sex roles, and you can see that gender roles overtook sex roles in the early 1990s. Um, incidentally, the editors of the journal Sex Roles, seeing the way the linguistic winds were blowing, tried to change the title to gender roles, but the publisher wouldn't let them. Um, and again, so, and again, gender roles, so here there's no need take gender to mean anything other than sex. Okay, so, right, so back to money's, the fate of money's gender role. Now let's look at uh, the word gender. So now we go to um, Stoller's book, Sex and Gender, in 1968. If the proper terms for sex a male and female, the corresponding terms, excuse me, the corresponding terms for gender are masculine and feminine. Gender is the amount of masculinity or femininity <laughs> found in a person. And then he speaks of, well, you laugh, but there are, this is still a very popular way of explaining the term gender, incidentally. Um, and then he speaks very unhappily of two <laughs> resultant genders, masculine and feminine. Now, of course, Stoller, I mean, this, was, uh, this is another illustration of a very bad neologism because, of course, femininity and masculinity come in degrees. The word gender doesn't take degree modifiers like, you know, more than or, or less than, and sort of even worse, as soon as you start to think about it, um, you know, you could be very masculine in one respect, slightly masculine in another respect, and very feminine in the other third respect. So the whole thing was pretty much a terminological disaster. You obviously, and one illustration of this is that if you really want to retain um, Stoller's word gender, but then respect the fact that, well, you know, there are sort of innumerable innumerable combinations of, subtle combinations of masculinity and femininity, then you're led to um, um, this book, um, How to Understand Your Gender. So this is written by, um, I'm alarmed to report, two therapists. So the, the, the closest they get to explaining what gender is in this book is they say, gender is a broad term that might include our identity, expressions, roles, or even larger sets of socio-cultural explanations, which is not very helpful. So things 
become clearer when they say, quite incorrectly, that gender identity is usually defined as an inner sense of who we are. So, oh, it's like this year. Yeah. Um, so, since one, one way of explaining gender identity is just to say, well, gender identity is one's awareness of one's gender. So that's basically right. But then if you combine that with this, gender has got to be um, who you are, whatever that means. So hence, the, hence the, the subtitle of the book, A Practical Guide for Exploring Who You Are. So this obviously just drains the word gender of any useful meaning at all. OK, now let me say something about, this is a very large topic, but something about the word gender in philosophy. So as Sally says, even a quick survey of the literature reveals that a large range of, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm multitasking here. Even a quick survey of the literature reveals that a range of things have counted as gender within feminist theorizing. Um, here is one um, uh, use of the word gender, which is very closely related to Sally's use of the word gender, and which I think is really the dominant usage of gen gender, at least in contemporary analytic philosophy, although you can certainly, this is not an exceptionalist generalization, and that's the use of the word gender for the categories woman and man, and maybe some more categories. So um, here, for example, is Judith Butler using the word gender in this way um, in a famous paper in 1986. Um, if being a woman is one cultural interpretation of being female, and if that interpretation is in no way necessitated by being female, then it appears that the female body is the arbitrary locus of the gender woman. Being female and being a woman are two very different sorts of things. That last insight, I would suggest, is the distinguished contribution of Simone de Beauvoir's formulation. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman, or in the present translation, but rather becomes woman. Q various interminable, interminable PhD theses <laughs> about this. Um, OK, so yeah, so here's Butler in a um, uncharacteristic, whoops, uh-oh. Now my screen has gone totally blank. Oh my god. OK, I can't see anything on the screen. OK, fine, good. Now I can. Ugh. OK, yeah, all right, so that's our uncharacteristic um, outburst of clarity from Butler. So uh, over in the, um, OK, so over in the, the reality-based community, um, uh, none of this shuffling around in the ivory tower um, could stop the inexorable rise of gender as a way of talking about sex. So this is from a paper by the Harvard biologist David Haig, The Inexorable Rise of Gender and the Decline of Sex, Social Change in Academic Titles, 1945 to 2001. And here's the social sciences. Uh, here's gender. And here are the, 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 the actual sciences. Um, uh, again, here's gender. So he, here, um, so, so here are some examples. So here are some examples from you know, some examples from science. You know, sex determination and gender expression in snails. And oh, sorry. Here's um, yeah, uh, sex determination, gender expression in snails. And uh, how how is the the gender of some reptiles determined by? Temperature, and then you know, if you look, here's, here's, here's an internet here's an internet example. What's the gender binary? Well, it's a classification system consisting of two genders, <coughs> male and female. Okay, so why did this happen? Well, Quine um, actually had the right um, explanation. I mean, Sal has already hinted to it. This is from Quine's entry on gender in Quidditties, which is just before the entry on Gödel's theorem, uh, the, the latter, the latter day upheaval, the latter day upheaval in sexual mores has increased the frequency of occasions for referring politely to copulation, and has thus created a, a demand for a short but equally polite word for the practice. 
<laughs> the practice of copulation. I love so the word sex has been pressed into that service and thus rendered less convenient as a means to referring to the sexes, as a means to referring to the sexes. The resulting need has been met in turn by calling the sexes genders and just some um, evidence that Quine is right. Here's another Google Engram thing, sort of having sex versus having intercourse and for some reason I mean, I think sexual intercourse was supposed to, sorry, yeah, that was supposed to start in 1963 or something, isn't that Larkin yeah. thing? Anyway, um, but yeah, having sex, very popular topic. <laughs> um, okay, so, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, what's interesting is that, um, despite the plain fact that the English word gender, in its most common sense, just means sex, that has not stopped people complaining about using the word gender instead of sex, or the word sex instead of gender. So, so he, the, the first one is from an op-ed from 25 years ago by a historian called Robert McElvain. Um, at last month's United Nations Conference on Human Rights in Vienna, petitions signed by half a million people around the world declared, we demand gender violence to be recognized as a violation of human rights. The violence complained of is all too real, but it is violence against a sex, not a gender. Then, there is my personal favorite, obviously he doesn't approve of this either, a recent headline, gender of blue crabs, easy to tell. Well, that was 25 years ago, uh, and now here's a, here's a tweet from like two days ago correctly gendered birth certificate? Why are you pretending that a UK birth certificate has gender on it? It doesn't, it has sex, and please don't try and pretend they're the same. You know they are not. Hashtag sex, not gender. Okay, so uh, despite these um, uh, complaints and various attempts to sort of force gender to mean something else, or in common usage, um, that the, the, there has been no effect, as far as I can tell. Um, okay, so now let me turn um, to the to the morals. Um, so here's um, Herman on a lack of control. So to, he says. To effectively make a, a change in the extension and intention of a term like marriage, you would need to understand the mechanisms of reference change. These mechanisms are also not known to any of us and might, in effect, be unknowable. Suppose meaning supervenes on extremely complex use patterns over long periods of time and that there's no algorithm for extracting meaning from those patterns. That makes it an illusion to think that we can be in a position to effectively predict and implement changes. But why? Um, do we need to know how meaning is related to a supervenience space to predict and implement changes? So consider neologisms again. So the English art historian Horace Walpole introduced the, neolo the ne neologism serendipity in like, the 18th century or something. Um, and then Tom Wolfe introduced the neologism radical chic, meant to describe the phenomenon whereby um, cultural elites insincerely embrace radical political causes. Um, it's not really surprising in hindsight that those words caught on. Um, Wolf could have had a reasonable belief, I think, at the time that radical chic would actually enter the lexicon. And then conversely, if you look at Dickens, who coined the term metropolitanously <laughs> to mean in a city-like fashion, well, it's not, again, it's not really surprising that that didn't work. And then similarly, we already saw money's gender role. You could have just, I mean, money was totally, he never changed his mind about the utility of gender role and what a great, uh, a, a great term it was as he um, uh, defined it. But everyone else kind of realized, no, this is not a useful expression uh, to have. So um, when it comes to neologisms, you're not just making a stab in the dark. You can make reasonable um, predictions. And then similarly, with when a word gains a new sense, as in mouse, which 
of course means small rodent, and then at um, like the 90s or the 80s or something, it uh, gained by metaphoric extension a new sense, meaning handheld cursor moving device. One could have reasonably speculated that that would have been a, um, a big success and would actually end up in the dictionary. Um, so, so despite the inscrutability of meaning from use, predictions of, of success are often more than mere guesses. Um, okay, so here's my here's my conjecture. It's certainly not something that I've really argued for, but I think it's sort of suggested by thinking about these examples and thinking about actual cases of language change. So words in common currency always make useful distinctions. <coughs> They're there for a reason. Um, so sometimes a word loses its earlier meaning because the original distinction is no longer useful. The facts on the ground change. So cheetah once meant officer appointed to look after the king's escheats, that is, property. Um, it's, lost, it's lost that meaning because there's, there's, um, there's no point to it anymore. There are no, there are no cheetahs left in that sense. Um, often it retains, a new word retains its old meaning and acquires a new one, as in the case of mouse. And sometimes the word is replaced or demoted by some synonym, as in the case of sex and gender, but that just makes the old distinction by new means. So what never, I mean, the question mark here is because I know virtually nothing about historical linguistics. The only, thing I, the only things I do know I've learned from Ari, who is up next. But anyway, my conjecture is it never happens that words change meaning with no replacement filling the gap, simply because the word is better suited to making another even more useful distinction. So that's why ordinary conceptual engineering, I think, is impossible, or at least infeasible. So in one respect, words are not, as Wittgenstein said, tools in a toolbox. Screwdrivers can always be upgraded, even in the middle of a, a job, um, but um, that's not the case with words. It's not that words in ordinary language have defects that we don't know how to fix. They actually don't have, in any useful sense, defects at all. So I suppose what I'm saying is, um, as usual, something that um, Wittgenstein said, um, every sentence of our language is in order as it is. Thank you. Interface of uh, common language and science, 
right? So we take a word from some other language, and then we move it to yeah. to some English context. Yeah. That's clearly going, that's clearly not going to be to be right when that happens for all its extensions out of the the usual patterns of of of, of use. Innateness, belief, emotion, desire. I mean, you know, you, you know, psychology. And you know, one of the trouble in psychology is that it is import of a common sense users into a scientific context. So it's true to, to some extent in biology. So that may well be true in some area, I think for common languages. But I worry is that um uh, there will be better contact with where well, that vaccine just does not apply. Um yeah, but in the case of in the case of psychology, what 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 do you have in mind? Well, exactly. Uh, I mean, say, let's like, take, take take belief. I mean, of course, you might think, well, I say psychologists talk of belief all the time, but really, yeah. they shouldn't be investigating the ordinary Emotions. notion of belief or something like that, or maybe the ordinary folk terms for the emotions don't carve reality at the psychological, psychological joint. That's right. Or in something there's no such thing like as that. innateness, as we understand it in everyday life. You know, it actually brings with it assumptions about development that are actually misleading in the way you study our development. I mean, well, in the, case, in the in the belief case, it's not. I I, I wouldn't pin the error. There's no need to pin the error on uh, on the word. Um, <coughs> rather, it's that um, okay. The, the psychologists now speaking ordinary language. The psychologists I suppose shouldn't be talking about belief. We should be we should be talking about something else. I mean, what I'm. What I'm sort of re reacting to is this impression, and this may not be correct, but I sort of get the impression from a lot of the, this conceptual engineering talk that the position with respect to ordinary language is sort of something like this. So imagine that we discovered that the word color um, includes red and blue and orange and green in its extension, that we, we somehow left out purple. Right. Well, that would clearly be some mistake, and um, the word is not fit for purpose. It's like you know we kind of built a wonky screwdriver or something, or a screwdriver with the wrong head, and so we need to fix up. So the defect is in language; it wasn't fit for purpose, for its original purpose. So we need to fix it up. That kind of thing. That's a very misleading picture. That 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 never happens. Of course, it can happen that. Um, um, the, the people that uh, the people shouldn't be using a particular word to describe what they're interested in, which it turns out they're really interested in something else. And also, but and also, I mean, this is a sort of separate issue. But yeah, should often scientists use expressions? that they take from ordinary language and then they, they give them some more or less precise meaning and maybe innateness is a good example of this um, uh, because of the meaning that scientists attach to the word compared to the meaning that ordinary people attach to the word it turns out this is a very bad a bad choice of words they should have chosen some other words because the ordinary language connotation is just people confused According to to the randomizer, I'm next. I wanted to ask you about the. Uh, I I know you probably thought of this. I'll just tell you. So this test on on the hand, the first page of the handbook, yeah. under three, where at T there will never be same sex marriage, and on D and T star sort of afterwards says. Yeah. A was wrong, and then that's good as evidence of a continuity and no change. Yeah. But if you have uh, these other more coarse grained components to characterize what is said, like topics, yeah. and you think topic continuity is persistent through changes in semantic values, then you could explain why it's good to say that because you're still talking about. Marriage, even though marriage is the kind of thing that can undergo 
Oh, okay, yeah, good, so good, so it doesn't good, good. Work as a test if you, but you might. Well, I was thinking. Well, my, that was the, that was the natural number example. So that was the natural number example. So. Sorry, why isn't the marriage case like that? I mean, why isn't? Because if the. It's good because. But, continuity in topic. but then, well, but there's also continuity in topic in the natural number case, and it's bad to say that A was wrong. Uh, sorry, I didn't think it, I didn't think it was wrong. So A and B are both, you know, you can certainly B can say, um, you know, A is some mathematician or something, uh, certainly B can say, well, you know, yeah, A is a theorist of the natural numbers and wrote a book about the natural numbers had various opinions about the natural numbers, even though in A's mouth, the, the phrase natural number has um, a slightly reduced extension to zero. So there's definitely some, some topic continuity. But what I'm saying is that if you look at this particular case where, where A says in old speak, zero is not a natural number, then um, B shouldn't Saying that A was wrong. I, I'm not sure I agree with that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that was anyway. That was the that was the purpose. That was the purpose of two. To, yeah. That was the purpose of two to precisely address the point you just raised. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll just move on. That's that's helpful. Two. Ah, that's me. Um. So just on the slide towards the end, where you said the language doesn't lose distinctions. Yeah. Even if that's right, it seems that's consistent with there being cases where, for example, you have two words that mean roughly the same thing, and then for various reasons it becomes very useful to have some, uh, some further distinctions made in the ballpark. For example, there are two things we thought went together, but then, but then split, and maybe the two words um, could then come to track those two things. So I think you, know, you can make the case that sex and gender is at least a potential case like this, even if they started off meaning the same thing, all of a sudden, you know, various distinctions then become salient over time, in particular, I think, over the last, say, decade or so, one distinction has become very salient, the distinction between, let's say, you know, biological features traditionally associated with, uh, with one sex and gender identity. And you know, certainly, I think there's been some kind of, there's been some trend for people to use uh, terms like gender Certainly, a very strong trend for people to use, you know, gender terms and man-woman terms for gender identity. And I think there's also been a reasonably strong trend for people to use certain words like biological sex for uh, for uh, for the biological kind. But I don't know that, that yeah. way of talking is widely rejected from all kinds of from, yeah, from those sides I, and all grounds. But nonetheless, I think if you did the sociological study, you'd find um, yeah some elements of a. Sex, gender, yeah, it's not a logical distinction from right. outside. Right. Uh, you you certainly can find usages of, of gender, even some in the psychological literature, to mean gender identity. Yes, you can definitely find some. But my impression is that usage isn't actually very isn't actually very quite spread. I mean, a usage which allows, for example, that there, there are women that are biologically male. Sorry, well, just a usage, for example, that allows there are women that are biologically male. Right. Gender, people who are gender, whose gender is woman, but whose uh, who sex is, let's say, male. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the philosophical way of talking. I don't, I mean, I'm open to correction on this point. I don't think that's really entered the ordinary way, the ordinary way of talking. I mean, you know, if you ask someone's gender, then what you're asking for is whether they're male or female. Of course, you know, I mean, the answer could be, you know, both or neither, or I refuse to answer the question, or I deny there's such a thing as male and female, or whatever. But that, that, that question is just... I don't, think anyone, I don't think anyone outside philosophy or outside the very small communities with their own proprietary vocabulary would just answer that question by saying, oh, you know, my gender is woman. Well, I can I see that uh, Sally is eager to answer, and you're next. Oh, I am next. Yeah, you are next. <clears throat> so it is oh, a follow-up. Randomly. Yeah, no, Randomly. It is, is it a follow-up? So I think that it's a little bit puzzled for maybe some reasons that about the 
the difficulty of the chain or the yeah. Okay, so I'm a little puzzled because you've given lots of evidence that gender um, has meant sex all along. Yeah. Um, and I'm with with Dave. I think you need to get out a little more. That <laughs> there, that the the because I think amongst young people, to ask whether someone is a boy or a girl or a man or a woman, um, they don't answer that based on inspection of genitalia. Right? That's not the basis that they use for, for assigning those terms. In fact, none of us do. But they, don't, they really don't think that that needs to be answered based on uh, even a, a supposition of one's genitalia. No, no, and I so, realize that. No, I so realize, there I is a, that. Right, but there right. is, so, and they would say that there's a difference between sex and gender. Right? Well, it's certainly true that I'm, I'm quite well aware of this, that uh, if you go on the internet, you'll find people as they're kind of coming at the issue from a conceivable direction, frantically insisting that there's a difference well, between... Well, how many gender, queer, sex. or trans people do you know? I mean, I, I'm well, surrounded by them. My, my yeah. friends have many, but most of my friends have children who are, right. are trans or gender queer. It just doesn't seem to me a, an unusual phenomenon at all. And the people... Do you mean to make the philosophical distinction no, I'm talking about the ordinary use of the term boy and girl or uh, man and woman um, as a gender term uh, and not as a sex term. I, I want to, I, I, okay, but wait, wait. I didn't say anything about boy or girl or man or, or woman. Right, but then when they're asking and then you say, oh, but this boy doesn't have a penis, and they say, Yes, well, I think that I'm talking about their gender, not their sex. I mean, that, this, is, this is everyday discourse. And so what you've given is a great example of conceptual amelioration, that gender used to be used for sex, but now it's not anymore. No, I, 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 don't, no, I don't actually agree with that. So, but this well, is well, well, we, we can, well, okay, but we can, yeah, well, we, on the one hand, we can talk about the terms boy, girl, man, woman, and maybe I, haven't, I haven't talked about those. You could argue that they have uh, that they have changed meaning, and indeed this has been some ordinary an example. What I was after of some ordinary conceptual engineering. You, you, but also, you should, you could, so you far as someone that. challenges, this goes back to Hartree's point. When you have a change like this, you need to sort of make sense of it. And so the way that people make sense of it is to, in, is to make reference to gender as distinct from sex. And they say, wait a minute. You know, they're talking about boys and girls. They say, but wait, this person, you know, blah, 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 P standing up, whatever. And they say, oh, yeah, I don't mean their sex. I mean their gender. Well, yeah, I mean, OK. But all right. I, I, I'm, well, let me just say, Say one thing. So, in parallel with it, with this kind of way of talking, has actually been an aversion to talking about uh, sex. So now, um, in many quarters, um, we we don't talk about someone's sex at birth. We talk about their sex assigned at birth. Um, so it's not that I think. People are just sort of totally comfortable with drawing this sharp distinction between between sex and gender and saying, oh well, yeah, look, there are all these, you know, these female boys. People generally don't like that way of, of talking. So I th think, yeah, things are complicated. Well, the, uh, let me just reveal the, the random number, and then you can the sequence of them, and then you can tell me if someone left outside. Three, then six, then.
you also talked about some other processes that you might think of as processes of conceptual engineering. So Dave, in the first talk, brought up this uh, idea of de novo. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, that's really my neologistic conceptual engineering. Okay. Yeah. And I was just wondering whether your, your general sort of skepticism about the possibility of conceptual engineering extends to these other cases. Okay, well let me just, can I just address the first one? Um, so, I would prefer yeah. if you... Okay, I can, I can address the first one. Sorry, I just tried to make some order. The easier one. So yeah, you know, actually, well, that was one of my points against Herman. So we don't know, okay, let's grant the, um, the inscrutability of being from use. Nonetheless, um, uh, neologistic conceptual engineering is not a complete waste of time. We can often be reasonably confident that you know we hit upon uh, just the right word to describe this new phenomenon. And I mean, in a way, the um, the case of neologisms has been, in a way, taken as a model for ordinary conceptual engineering, and that, that's very misleading. So we saw in the case of money, money described um, in terms of gender roles, this kind of mishmash of gender roles, et cetera. There, um, um, there, there was a mistake. Right? There was something wrong, in some clear sense, with money's term gender role. It didn't answer to uh, um, a need. So there really was something defective about money's gender role as he introduced it. And I think that what, what's not clear at all is that terms of ordinary language are, are defective and everything in the same sense. So because they've sort of survived this test of fire, they've been introduced into the language, they can only flourish and propagate throughout um, uh, uh, linguistic space if you know they're answering to some genuine need and you can get rid of if you don't like the term then there's nothing for the conceptual engineer to do there might be something for the social engineer to do you can change the facts on the ground so people don't need to talk about this thing anymore but that's different from conceptual engineering sorry i'm just trying to over talk to avoid addressing the second <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can also. I think you can. You can change how you assess the truth of propositions. Yeah. So, like, say you 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 consider propositions such as uh, women have long hair or something like that, and then and then you can look at different partitions of the population at, when you consider whether that's true or not. Um, and I was thinking that a change in your practice of how you assess a proposition such as that could also count as such as as a as a process of conceptual engineering, and like nothing, nothing in what you said. So, and yeah, okay. Right. You well, can well, individually well. change it. Like yeah. you individually can change how you go about assessing the truth of claims about women. Or yeah, no, that's right. Of course, that's a generic. So that has some of the problems of generics generally. Um, the name, the name you was. Uh, what? Who mentioned uh, Sarah? Oh, oh, sorry, you did, right? <laughs> <laughs> Blurred into one. But yeah, no, that's right. That's right. No, I, right. I, I agree. I didn't mean to rain on conceptual engineering generally, but just conceptual engineering understood as ordinary conceptual engineering, where the ordinary word is supposed to have some kind of a defect. I don't think that it's a helpful way of thinking of the situation. You were three, right? Yes. So no, it's number six. I'm six. Um, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add to what Sally and Dave said. I have very similar views here. Um, but maybe a bit on the empirical evidence or strength and weaknesses of, of yeah. different kinds. So, so because it looks to me like Hopper, what's that his name, from 1955, when they introduced gender role? Uh, money, John Money. Money, yeah. So it looks to me like money was a successful conceptual engineer, and part of my evidence for this is, is just having spent lots of time around 20-somethings, I don't tell children, and all this sort of stuff. I know at Denver East High School and Boulder High School, this distinction between gender roles and biological sex is absolutely standard, at least among 
sort of all their friends and that sort of thing. So it looks like money did it. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like a, a, a success story. What about the scientific cases? Um, I think in that case you get these writers, you know, the, the, the scientists talking about the gender of crabs and whatnot, because this is just the kind of case where the two don't come apart. Behavior is generally biologically determined by factors that also determine sexual organs. And so there's just not much purpose in that context for drawing any kind of distinction. So they don't mark it, because in their world, these things do, don't come apart. So I think that's a way of maybe bracketing some of that, that evidence. Well, no, no, no. OK, so I really disagree with that. So, so in the first place, um, my money, OK, so this is the great question. But, um, but in the first place, sorry, I wasn't very clear. Maybe I wasn't very clear about money. Who went by rather quickly. So money successfully introduced the phrase gender role. He did not successfully introduce the phrase gender role, parceled with the meaning that we thought that it should have. He thought that it should mean this big conglomeration of things, including sexual orientation, that is not what the word gender role currently means. Second, when scientists talk about the gender of blue crabs, whatever, they are just talking about the sex of blue crabs. And so there, but there are plenty of animals where um, it's called, the phenomenon is called sexual mimicry, where one sex can mimic the behavior of the other sex. So for example, Australian cuttle, male Australian cuttlefish will dis disguise themselves as females. So in order to sneak up to a, uh, in order to get sort of get an advantage when it comes to mating over a rather man, because the other man thinks that they're females, and so no threat. Um, scientists would not make some, you know, when describing this behavior, they would not make some distinction between sex and gender, although they might use the expression gender role or gender typical behavior or something like that, in order to support forward or uh, gender expressions, they do it for snails. So snails are hermaphrodites, and the point of talking about gender expression in snails is to talk about whether the snail in question, which is both male and female, um, is a sperm donator or a sperm receiver. But, yeah. um, it's, it's, so I think what you don't see in the animal case with, say, mimicry is you don't see the need that money saw. Whether you got all the details right is another question. You don't see the need to talk about the psychological experience of the animals. That's the sort of need that I think money saw was that humans relate to their own, what I would call gender-related behavior in important psychological ways. And, and that's the demand that he's speaking to or he was speaking to. It's part of it. Yeah, I, I was. So, of course, the scientists don't mark this. I completely yeah. agree with that. We have all, but we have all these expressions um, like gender identity and um, gender role and uh, gender expression and gender typical interests and gender nonconformity and so forth, which make all these distinctions. But um, that's not a reason for thinking the word gender is the word gender by itself has changed its meaning from sex. We have all these compounds involving the word gender, which are very useful for precisely. Okay, number four. That's me. Yeah. Um, I'm interested, uh, again, in the judgment of uh, item three on your hand up. Yeah. Um, I'd give you a slightly different example. Um, mathematician, let's say, in the 16th or 17th century, says negative numbers don't have square roots. Although we write as though they do. Don't. And then later on, either the same mathematicians or later mathematicians say um, they were wrong. Some negative numbers do have square roots. <coughs> or generally, negative numbers do have square roots. Yeah. Um, so now, that's good. When they say that's good, they, they were wrong, uh, is that, would we say, good? Uh, more importantly, what would be the criterion for making this judgment about, about that? Yeah, that's good. I mean, I'm not totally sure what 
to say about that. I mean, of course, one thing you might, one thing you could say is, as these earlier mathematicians might have put it, um, well, you know, we, we're pretty sure that the real numbers are the only numbers there are, but, you know, if there are somehow other numbers that mathematicians haven't discovered yet, you know, we, we, have, we have no conception of what they might be. That would kind of just make, make it a bit like the watch case where someone in the 19th century might say, um, yeah, well, look, you know, maybe there could be watches that aren't mechanical, but we have no idea what they might be like. So if, if that, so on that way of thinking of it, the, the mathematician who said that um, minus one doesn't have a square root were, were wrong. Um, of course, another one, another way of interpreting it, maybe what they just meant was that maybe they simply meant um, negative one doesn't have a real square root. How, how, I was kind of keeping, losing track of how far over the schedule we're going to do. Clara, they Ten minutes. Remember. Ten what? minutes. Ten minutes. Well, now we're coping even more of a schedule design. Matter? What Six? Time? What? what Depends what time the session started. I don't remember. I think it started, it started on time. It started at yeah, it started on time, so we're like five minutes early. Well, then, I yeah. think we just have to thank your speaker, otherwise, we'll be. Yeah. Yeah.